cool. We get to start a little early. Thank you all for coming. This is the unintended risk of trusting Active Directory. So my name is Will Schrader. My <laughs> handle is Harmjoy. Yeah, I've got my little Yoda picture. I think that was yeah, someone on our team is a uh, pretty good Photoshop. So I'm a red teamer, and I like to call myself an offensive engineer. I work at SpectreOps, so I build a lot of tools. I'm an Adaptive Threat Division alumni, I blog a lot, and I'm a co-founder and co-developer for Ghostpack, the new C-Sharp stuff that we'll demo a little bit today, uh, Empire, Bloodhound, and the Veil framework. So my name is Lee Christensen, Tiffkin on Twitter. I do a bunch of stuff at SpectreOps. Uh, I, I'm also uh, just going after shiny things all the time, so be that offensive or defensive, I kind of flip both sides. I'm kind of in the background on a lot of things, so I don't see a lot of my projects, but I contribute in a lot of kind of behind the scenes type things. Yep, and I'm going to have to kneel down. Um, so, uh, I'm Matt Nelson, uh, Twitter is at x 3 um, I'm a senior operator and researcher at SpectreOps, um, so I do a lot of the research that uh, these guys kind of start building tools for, um, solving problems that we have on operations and stuff like that. Uh, I also blog a lot. Um, I'm one of the few people in the world that claim they sort of like calm a little bit um, and then hold a handful of CVEs. All right, so we're going to start this talk with a question. What is admin access? We're going to make the argument that many of us have been kind of approaching this problem in operational testing kind of in the wrong way. We've been approaching the concept kind of in the wrong way. The admin access is a lot more complicated than just membership and local administrators. While this covers many of the cases, there are some edge cases where things can get really interesting, where you can perform certain actions on hosts without being a member of the local administrators group. So, this is kind of one of our big points in the talk, is that admin access is more than membership and just, you know, local administrators. So, the true nature of admin access. Our controversial statement is, membership in a system's local administrators group, like I mentioned, isn't what actually matters. What actually matters is what local and domain groups or principles, in a, from, we're talking about a domain scenario with a domain <coughs> system. We care about what local domain groups or users have access to specific remote resources on a host, whether that's RPC servers, remote registry, WMI, SQL, you know, many, 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 there's a million of these different host-based security descriptors. And we'll get into exactly what security descriptors are and what they matter, or why they matter. So as an example, you have your host. Many people just think, okay, I need to pop this host. I'm going to do like a Bloodhound attack graph, or I'm going to do whatever else, and I can figure out who's the member of local admins on this box, and then I'm going to do my lateral movement and pop the machine. But this is what the system actually is. It's not just one host where like local admins is the monolithic you get remote access to the system. A host is a collection of services. Many of these are registered in Active Directory through Kerberos or other authentication protocols. So you can have your WMI, your WinRM, Service Control Manager, all this kind of stuff I talked about. So what controls access to these particular remote services that all act independently? So again, there's not a single security descriptor or there's not a single set of rules that says user A, B, and C has access to all these things. Each service contains their own set of rules in the host in the form of security descriptors. It's just binary blobs that says who can do what to this particular service. So, for example, for a service control manager, you can have, you know, local administrators have generic all, we'll get into all these kind of components in a second, but you can also have domain users that are explicitly added, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to the security descriptors for particular services that might allow you to perform certain type of traditionally administrative actions on the host. So, Will just stated that services have security descriptors and those security descriptors control access to those services. So, what are security descriptors and why should we care about them? Security descriptors are the mechanism that Windows uses to control access to a service. Uh, so, any sort of securable object we say. Um, securable objects are, so what are they? Uh, any object that can have a security descriptor. Kind of a dumb definition. Uh, it's, but essentially what that means is you have this security descriptor. It's just a structure inside of Windows. It has a bunch of different components. Um, as an attacker, we're very interested in those two red highlighted group, uh, fields there. So an owner and a DACL. So uh, what we're going to dive into a little bit about what these are. Uh, worth mentioning is the SACL, because that is a component that defenders can use to 
monitor access to uh, these objects. So we're going to focus in a little bit on the owner and the DACL and how we as attackers can use them to our advantage. <coughs> so the first instance is that owner field. Uh, owners have complete control over an object by default. So if I'm the owner of, uh, of an object, then that means I can uh, add rights to it. So I could say, Will now has rights to uh, control this object. I can write to that object. I just have complete control. Likewise, that second field uh, was the DACL. So the DACL is a list of access control entries. So it's just a list of permissions granting or denying users access to the object. So if you take like a file object, for example, uh, there's diff uh, in the DACL, there's different rules that allow and deny users access to that file. Uh, these uh, files are not the only securable object, like we mentioned. There's a bunch of different uh, kinds out there, file shares, uh, files, Active Directory objects, all of these have owners, all of these have DACLs on them that control access to those objects. So how does this familiarly, or how does this normally look? Um, if you've ever looked, right clicked on a file, for example, and looked at the permissions, this is what it's looking like underneath. Um, you can see the DACL is outlined there, and there's on the left you see the type of access, so these are allow access. And then inside, uh, there's a list of permissions that are granted. So you can see we're allowing marketer read access uh, in this case. And you can see that IT admin and the administrators have full control over this, this folder up at the top. So that's it. In this case, we're talking about a file object, the downloads folder. Uh, with, and in addition, so that's the DACL. And then up uh, right underneath, you can see the owner is that IT administrator as well. So that owner can do anything to that object. So we have these objects. They have their owners and their DACLs on them. Uh, and then when, an, when a, another user tries to interact with that service, so let's say it's a file, uh, file share, the individual service performs an authorization check. It's not some centralized component inside of Windows that's doing the authorization check or deciding who gets access to the file share. It's the file share service itself that performs the authorization check. The same goes for WMI, the Server Control Manager, etc. Those all have security descriptors that say who can access each one of those services. So what the service does is it compares, it looks at the user who's connecting to the service, and then it looks at its security descriptor and says, is the connecting user a member in the, in the DACL, in the security descriptor? Um, if so, we're going to grant them access. If it's not in the list of accepted users, they're going to be denied access. So fairly simple. Um, you see this a lot. So a lot of Windows services has the local administrators group added or granted access to things. So for example, the service control manager or WMI um, or the like SIFS, the file share, uh, local administrators by default are added to the DACLs of each one of these services. That's why they can access them. However, you know, those Local administrators could also, could also be removed from those same security descriptors, and then they wouldn't be able to access those services anymore. Cool. So why do we really care about all of that um, would be a good question to have. So as far as you know, Active Directory environments and specifically all the hosts inside them, it's really hard to determine if a, mis or if a DACL change is you know, supposed to be there. Um, if it was made by some sort of product on accident or a misconfiguration or if it was maliciously put there. Uh, so doing that at scale uh, is not an easy thing to do. And does anybody here monitor all the DACLs on their endpoints? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like I mentioned, I've got existing misconfigurations. So these are typically useful in, you know, in a privilege escalation scenario. Um, you know, the ability for a little privilege user to modify something um, due to a DACL misconfiguration. Or malicious configuration. So an attacker, um, you know, placing a you know backdoor DACL on an object in order to uh, kind of remain, remain inside the environment. So the cool thing about these is, since it's not easy to audit or monitor outside of SAPLs, um, you know, the forensic footprint that exists there is pretty pretty small. So it's a pretty safe way for an attacker to remain persistent in an environment and not really have to worry about um, that backdoor access being discovered. 
Additionally, uh, many teams, um, you know, blue and red, aren't aware of these configurations, let alone, you know, using them or looking for them, um, which kind of adds this double component for utilizing these uh, operationally. So, like, uh, like Will Lee mentioned, um, Postbase security descriptors uh, is more than just a service control manager. So, like we said, all of the uh, different services and resources in Windows are controlled uh, via, you know, entries into the DACL. So, did anyone happen to see our talk last year at Derby on the host base stuff? A few hands, yeah. So we covered additional, uh, like five different backdoor scenarios specifically for host base DACLs. Additionally, we've done some research on the Active Directory side that we'll talk about in a bit. But So we're only going to touch on a couple of use cases specifically on the host side, but there's many, 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 many more. Yeah, this is just the, uh, this is just the surface. So, um, Microsoft's documented a lot of these securable objects out there. Um, in the documentation, there are roughly 20 to 30 of them. Uh, through enumeration, we've identified over 70 that exist. So there's a lot of attack surface as far as uh, you know, different operational components you can utilize. Um, for RPC server specifically, which is, like we mentioned, a securable object, um, if you're going to utilize those, um, you know, unless you really want to spend the time reverse engineering, uh, Microsoft's documented, documented most of those RPC servers for you, which is really, really nice. So, Lee also has a script called Find at Registry Security Descriptors uh, sitting somewhere on the internet. I don't think it's on a GitHub. I found it on some like, cached website earlier today. Um, so we'll have that reposted as well, which can kind of show you what it might look like when you go to enumerate those. Um, has anybody heard of NT Object Manager from James Forshaw? So it's a really great tool to also kind of go through and analyze some of the underlying components of Windows, specifically some of the security descriptor stuff. So when you're using Lee scripts, uh, this is what the output looks like. So uh, all this does is it goes through the registry and it tries to identify any kind of binary blobs and then it tries to convert that into a valid security descriptor and then output that for you. So this will just kind of show you some of the different objects that are registered in the registry that have a security descriptor applied to them. Um, and then you can manually go through the hundreds of thousands of results and kind of derive what you want to utilize there. So we're talking about security descriptors. Um, there are kind of two different kinds, um, per se. So there's persistent and there's kind of runtime or dynamic objects. Um, each object gets their, can get their security descriptor from a different place. So just because the RPC, you know, the RPC, some RPC service has a security descriptor applied to it, um, that how it's applied might not be the same for some other object. So if you've got persistent objects, so a security descriptor that's applied to something like a file, um, you know, you right-click properties, you get a security tab, that's a security descriptor for that file, uh, you know, the registry, et cetera. Uh, runtime would kind of apply towards more dynamic objects, so things like processes and tokens. So security descriptors, like they mentioned, define access to what resource the user can have, which more or less defines boundaries, um, you know, for a user as far as what they can do. So when you're enumerating these, um, we typically have an approach of enumerating locally and remotely, both, both privileged and unprivileged. Um, the reason for this is because in order to enumerate some components, um, you have to have specific token levels and um, just kind of get as much information as you can uh, doing it locally, remotely, uh, and privileged and unprivileged. That will be the best results. So an example of this uh, remote registry, like we will mention, we uh, talked last year at Derby on something similar to this. Um, so just think of a scenario of remotely dumping a machine's uh, account hash. So for those of you that aren't familiar with that, uh, thanks to um, Benjamin's great work um, and many others, uh, you can use that machine account hash to do things like silver tickets and other various attacks. So this kind of attack or this kind of backdoor persistent access is going to set up to allow an attacker to remotely retrieve a remote computer's machine account hash without having any administrative access to that host. Administrative, yeah. Due to a very granular um, DAPL change that we've made. So the process for backdooring this would look something like this. So we're first, um, in order to apply the backdoor, we want to allow a specific user or group. It doesn't have to be one thing or another, it can be you know whatever whatever user account or group access you want to add to it, allowing that user to remotely access remote registry. So uh, that's defined via the WinReg key um, in the registry. So you can use WMI uh, to go over and add that uh, specific user that you want uh, to be able to access that. Then you just add a few different aces to some uh, different uh, registry hives and keys that will allow you to pull that pull back the key material that you need to calculate and, and retrieve the machine account hash for that, that guy. So in that case, we're adding, we're modifying the security descriptor of the registry, the remote registry service, 
to allow us to allow an unprivileged user to get access to these sensitive um, registry keys and, and values. So obviously you need administrative access or privilege in the environment to do this, given you know it's a persistent technique, but that can allow an attacker to say, I want for the exchange server, for the domain control, I want to grant you know Nancy from HR the ability to retrieve this account hash, or I want to grant you know authenticated users or domain <coughs> users. So if they get back in the environment, they can immediately you know elevate back up that domain. So once we've added that backdoor, the process for retrieving this is pretty straightforward. So as that backdoor user or group, we're going to connect to the remote host um, over remote registry. We're able to do that because we've added that, that backdoor privilege for that specific user. Open up specific registry keys that are linked to LSA and extract those classes. Combine these classes, the values to calculate the boot key. Use that boot key to decrypt, to decrypt the LSA key. And then we can finally use the LSA key to decrypt the machine account hash for that remote host. So again, we're all able to do this because even though the user is not an administrator on their remote host, we've granted a specific user or group the appropriate permissions for the DAPL that allow us to access this information. Does anybody think that they would be able to see that kind of thing on their network right now? Maybe too. Once that happens, uh, everybody gets a silver ticket. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. So that was the host side. And now we're going to talk about the Active Directory security descriptor side. Then we're going to combine them together and show how the system works kind of holistically. So again, all these security descriptors are just the access control model. Active Directory needs an access control model just like everything else. So one really big advantage with Active Directory is that by default, the DACLs for almost every single object in Active Directory, users, groups, subnets, like OUs, almost everything, can be enumerated by any domain authenticated user through LDAP. So you do not have to be privileged in the domain to pull all of the security descriptor information for almost every object in Active Directory. This is actually something that's been integrated into the Bloodhound project to where you can actually start to map these permissions at scale. Some other advantages of a backdoor approach or mis misconfiguration approach for Active Directory with ACLs is these changes also have a minimal forensic footprint. So even if people do find a bad thing and know it's bad, it's very difficult to, unless they had specific event log tuning on the domain controller where that change was made, when that change was made, it's very difficult to figure out who even made the change or exactly when the change was made. Changes in Active Directory for persistence also will survive operating system and domain functional level upgrades. This kind of leads into a term that we're kind of calling misconfiguration debt, to where if you have a domain that's been around for 15 years and you installed some crappy third-party thing 13 years ago that added itself all these permissions and all these all this kind of stuff in the access control model, even if you remove that, even if you remove that solution as your domain is upgraded, many of these permissions likely still persist. So you just get all this cruft and things start to build on each other. And we found old permissions from you know like 2003 or something like that that still exists in a modern domain. Also, anti-audit measures can be taken. We're not going to touch on this uh, really during this presentation, but a uh, little over a year ago, Andy Robbins and myself gave a talk called An Ace Up the Sleeve at Black Hat, uh, building the Active Directory uh, persistent backdoor. So there's ways that you can actually prevent like domain admins from enumerating the security descriptor information for specific objects or hiding principles. So even if people find the bad entry, know it's bad, know it's not a accidental misconfiguration, uh, you can actually like take anti-audit measures to mess with blue teamers even more. That was us trying to go as evil as possible. So this is the graphical representation of all that security descriptor stuff for Active Directory in ADUC. So we have permission entry for a victim user, so this is the victim object. We have the principal, so this is the person that has the rights. And we see there's a whole bunch of different rights. Some of the ones we care about are like modified permissions, so you can grant yourself anything you want, modify the owner because they have full control, force reset the password, lots of other stuff. So what rights do you care about? In the white paper that's on our site along with, uh, that was in correlation with the Ace Up the Sleeve talk, we have like a 60 page Active Directory only security descriptor white paper that covers all these more depth. But in general we care about the generic all right, which grants generic rights to the object, uh, the generic right object, which allows for modifications of almost all properties of a specified object. Uh, right DACL, 
which you don't have the ability to like force reset someone's password, but you have the ability to grant yourself the ability to force reset someone's password. Or right owner, so if all you have is right owner, you can just modify the owner of that object to yourself, and then you have full control. Object-specific rights we care about. This is not complete, somewhat abbreviated. There's a couple new ones we have in the new Bloodhound stuff. But for users, we generally care about the force reset password right. So can we reset the password without knowing the previous value? Or can we modify the service principal name so we can do targeted Kerber hosting, say an SPN, Kerber hosting, resetting it? For groups, can we modify the member property to modify group membership? Uh, for computers, we actually don't have a generic ACL-based or DACL-based takeover primitive yet outside of LAPS. So you have the ability to like grant somebody uh, the ability to read the LAPS password as a backdoor, but outside of that, we don't have a generic takeover. For TPOs, we care, can someone uh, modify the GPC file sys path? So do they have the ability to edit the GPO files on syslog? And for domains, the domain object itself, which is a securable object, if you have the right DACL or generic all ability over the root domain object, you can grant yourself a DC sync rights. So as an example, abusing Exchange. Uh, Exchange Server is one of the worst perpetrators of really messed up ACL-based uh, configurations, or at least it was. Newer versions of Exchange have cleaned this up, but previous versions of Exchange would just grant itself 10 million rights all over the domain. And again, because you know, even if the domain is upgraded or Exchange is upgraded, things don't go back in and rip out the old ACL rights because people don't want to break stuff. So if you had ever installed an old version of Exchange in your environment, those bad misconfigurations are probably still there. It's a ton of ton of stuff. So this makes it a perfect spot for us to blend within the noise. So specifically, pre-Exchange Server 2007 SP1, Exchange granted the right tackle privilege against the domain object itself for the Exchange Trusted Subsystem Group. So this is a group that all Exchange servers are a member of, and that group has the ability to modify the ACL information on the root domain object. So, just as a pen test tip, I guess, if you ever compromise an Exchange server, you elevate the system, the system is going to use the machine account uh, hash permissions or the machine account permissions when it's communicating on the network, you should be able to grant anyone you want the ability to DC sync on the domain. So you just one hop away. Just an example. And we have a case study that will go into that. So we've talked a little bit about on the host side, you know, that we have these different services we can interact with now. We've also talked about how we have Active Directory. We have Active Directory objects that we can also interact with. Um, why this is interesting is because when you start combining those two separate kind of disparate systems together, uh, you start uh, introducing a bunch of different risks inside of the environment. So let's say you have an individual host not joined to the domain. Um, you know, that's a pretty secure host uh, because it's in control of what can access that machine. So it can define you know, who controls access to the, the service control manager remotely. It can say who, who accesses like WMI, that kind of thing. That host itself is solely in control uh, of itself. After a machine is joined to Active Directory, however, this uh, control model changes. So the machine itself is no longer in char charge of authentication. So an individual host, by default, is going to be using uh, like this HAM database for authentication and using like NTLM uh, underneath for authentication. Uh, after you join Active Directory, that changes. Kerberos and the domain controller get thrown in the, into the situation, and that machine isn't the sole authentication provider. Um, that permits you know, a, a variety of different attacks, like silver tickets and golden tickets, um, which, get, which can allow an attacker access to the system. Uh, likewise, Key material uh, is no longer stored solely on that uh, individual host. So, for example, if, it's, uh, if the host is just isolated by itself, all the passwords are in the SAM database, uh, and if an attacker attacks another machine on the network, uh, they're not going to be able to immediately access this individual host because all the passwords are stored on that host only. After you join Active Directory, that changes. Uh, the domain controller has passwords in it, a uh, certificate, Authority, the CA servers have some info, you know, your federation services may have some stuff. All these things may end up uh, allowing, compromising those machines may grant you access to this individual host now, uh, since it's joined to the domain. Uh, likewise, that individual host is no longer control of its own security groups anymore. Um, 
So uh, by default, when you jo join a machine into Active Directory, uh, the domain administrators group is added to the local uh, administrators group. So now you have these other groups in the domain uh, that can now access this machine. Those groups may have other groups and other users in it, and so now all of those people are implicitly trusted to access this machine. Likewise, management of that machine is no longer to that individual host anymore. Before, if it was just one host by itself, you log in, you know, use the GUI, use whatever you want, configure the host. Once it's joined to Active Directory, however, you bring in other management solutions, such as uh, group policy. So now there's other things in the network and in the domain that are going to be influencing how this host functions and is configured, and it may result in uh, unintended access to this host. So uh, how does this look? Again, just a different way to looking at that. Um, so when you're in a work group, so just that isolated computer by itself, you have local users and groups only. Those are the only security principles. Uh, you have, how do you control access to that machine? And that's based off of host-based security descriptors. So we can change like the WMI service, the service control manager individually, and grant other local users and groups uh, to those services. Authentication is through uh, the SAM database, uh, so like NTLM uh, or LM. And then how is, how are, how is that res resource administered or configured? Uh, usually that's like a manual process, or you know you may have like some like PowerShell scripts on the machine that can that configure the object or the host. However, once you join that machine to Active Directory, this entire model is expanded, um, which could result in some unintended consequences. So now you have, uh, in terms of security principles, you now have domain users and groups being added who have control to this machine now. Uh, in terms of access, granting access to this machine, those same domain groups um, may be controlled by other people in the environment. So uh, you may add a group to the local administrators group, and then you know a random IT administrator in a different part of the network may start adding users to that group. Uh, that you never intended, uh, those users that were added were never intended to gain access to your individual host. Uh, in addition, you have different authentication mechanisms that can now be used to access the host beyond just like the SAM database. Kerberos, NTLM, uh, those include uh, different uh, keys that you can access to gain access to this individual host. And configuration is now changed because you have, you have things like GPOs that can be abused uh, to uh, configure the host. All right, same thing graphically, hammering the point home. So we have our single host. And again, there's a million different services on it. We're going to focus just on DCOM, distributed com. We have a local user with admin. There's a local administrators group and a distributed com users group. That is just by default. So say this admin is a member of local admins, <coughs> and we have an empty distributed com users group. Those have the ability to invoke distributed com objects on the system. OK, <coughs> relatively secure, you know, randomized admin password, blah, blah, blah. So then we have our domain. We have different users, groups, machines, people logged in, and this is essentially you know that Bloodhound style attack graph. So you can have domain users nested in additional groups, say domain admins. And say this machine is joined to AD. And by default, domain admins are going to be added to the local admins group. So now we have leave, domain admins, everyone else that can invoke distributed com objects. And you can also have individual domain users, other principles, that can be manually added, whether through some third-party software or maliciously or whatever, to things like the distributed com users group. So now this person has the ability to invoke distributed com objects and get code execution in the remote system, even though they are not in local admins. You also have all the inbound control attack paths to like all these users and groups as well. So this is all the additional risk that you're introducing with to this individual host by the single act of adding to Active Directory. You can also have users that log in on this host, so domain principles that log in on this host. They could be members of additional other groups and everything. So the idea here is on the first part, you have additional risk inbound into the host. And depending on the security of your host, so you don't lock it down, you have some RCE. Uh, sorry, I don't know. 
and you have additional like outbound different kind of control objects or relationships going from the host. So someone compromised the system, it has a turtle blue or whatever on it. I'm just gonna keep talking while they have to chug really warm soon enough ice. I'm very happy. Uh, so that machine is compromised, the token stolen, and that person that's a member of these server admins, there's now outbound access to other nodes in the network that your machine affected. So inbound and outbound. You want me to keep talking while you're doing that? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like me the last two years. So security implications. Host-based security descriptors are kind of the missing link when thinking about domain attack graphs. So we've been thinking about these domain attack graphs for a while, of like fancy stuff, Bloodhound, you know, John Library stuff and all that. So host-based security descriptors kind of help logically fill this gap in the entire system. Something I do want to emphasize there is there is a ton of securable objects that nobody has looked at. Uh, like there's the obvious things that we've mentioned already, like WMI, the service control manager, all those things. But there's hundreds of RPC servers that are accessible remotely that I'm sure none of you have ever heard of um, and have never looked at. So uh, that's why we're trying to emphasize is there's all this additional attack surface that nobody's looking at that are that is extremely important, and we'll show why in a little bit. Uh, likewise, we know that there's existing misconfigurations. Uh, we blatantly shown that with Active Directory, or with Active Directory through, uh, yeah, through Bloodhound, um, and we'll give an example of this later on. Uh, likewise, a really important thing too is when you combine these two worlds together, you have misconfigurations on a host, those misconfigurations can, you know, uh, lead to escalation or lateral movement inside of Active Directory and the environment as a whole. So. Uh, essentially, like host-based host security descriptors can fill in or can provide opportunities for escalation inside of Active Directory when there's not solely a single escalation path in Active Directory just itself. The inverse is true uh, as well. So if you're trying to attack an individual host, you may not be able to gain access to it. But if you go through Active Directory, you can then gain access to that host. So it brings in additional attack paths and attack vectors to get access to whatever you're targeting. So when you join a system active directory, like we kind of hammered in, you're introducing additional nodes into the access graph that may affect the security of other systems. Again, you know, perfect world, perfect stock install and everything, there's no problem. But in the real world, there are going to be an enormous number of misconfigurations or misconfiguration debt and all these types of things or potentially malicious backdoors. And again, you're also implicitly trusting the security of a large number of other systems in the graph as well. So you're almost certainly, as Lee mentioned, exposing your system services to more access than you realize. So we realize this is kind of maybe seems self-evident, but this is just the way we broke the problem down of thinking of host, host-based security descriptors combined with Active Directory and everything to where the actual attack graph is enormous, to where we only model the 80 Active Directory, like ACL-based component with Bloodhound in the real world or in the, like what the attack graph actually is would include the security descriptor information for every single service and every single host, including all those like hundreds or thousands of RPC servers. Something that on that same note is, so say you have your individual host, say it's like a database that has tons of information, you want to restrict access to it uh, and limit that as much as possible. So maybe you just allow one domain group access to that but that domain group itself is controlled by IT administrators that may not have the same security mindset that you do. So they may inadvertently, without understanding the security implications, start adding users and other groups to that, that group. And so, again, it's un unintended consequences. You never had that intent of granting anybody else access, but because other people didn't have the same security mindset as you, uh, these new paths have been introduced. Cool. So first case study that we're going to talk about for kind of weaponization, uh, we're going to pick on Exchange again. So like Will mentioned, um, the Exchange trusted subsystem, uh, which contains you know, all the administrators or all the Exchange servers in that group, uh, typically will have a large amount of rights over the domain or the domain objects. So we can kind of abuse the remote registry backdoor um, to go from um, you know, keeping our access to the environment by allowing any defined group or user uh, to basically become instant DA. <coughs> Video demo of this. I don't know how computers work. So, add remote reg backdoor is a function we wrote to backdoor 
a remote registry specifically for removing or extracting the machine account hash. So let's give it a computer name. In this case, we're doing an exchange. We're adding a domain user called Jason. So Jason has no privilege in the environment. He's just you know some random Joe Schmo. After we have added or modified the security descriptor on those objects, that's the entire background. Yeah, um, we can now switch over to Jason um, here in a second. Uh, what's cool about this is a scenario, like I mentioned earlier, would be if an attacker gets kicked out, they can refish, they can add a group uh, to that, and then you know, kind of could pivot up and that way. So we've got a function called get machine or get remote machine account hash, give it the computer name as that user, and then it'll just pop out the machine account hash for remote host. So since we're doing this against Exchange, we can utilize kind of the misconfiguration that a lot of organizations kind of inherit um, to do some really nasty stuff. So here we're just taking the hash and we're using uh, overpass the hash to kind of put ourselves in that context since we've got the uh, machine account uh, hash. So we use Mimikaz to do this. Um, the user is going to be the exchange server dollar, so the computer account and the hash of that. So now that we're running as that, uh, we can pop up Mimikaz again. Um, and we can kind of demonstrate that, you know, we can do more or less whatever we want. In this case, uh, since, um, you know, the exchange trusted subsystem has a lot of control over those different objects. Uh, we can do something like DC sync. Uh, we can instantly or pull ran the ourselves DC sync rights or yeah. whatever rights that uh, exchange. Server. So here we just pulled the carry DGT hash <coughs> the domain using the backdoor that we've installed as a um, you know, just having access to that exchange server. Cool. All right. So like kind of cool. There's one like you make one little backdoor to one system. There's no malware running. You can come back in and then pop the entire domain at will forever, basically, unless someone found that backdoor in the registry on that one exchange box and they wiped everything out. So say, second case study. That one was persistence. So again, you had to be elevated on that exchange server to implement the backdoor. But persistence. Now we're going to cover existing misconfigurations. At least going to cover a really cool thing that he found. So we have a couple of ingredients. First ingredient is unconstrained delegation. Um, so. Everybody perfectly understands Kerberos, so you know I'm just going to be able to explain this in 20 seconds. Uh, yeah, totally. So if a, I'll, there's going to be a link at the end if you want more information on this. But TLDR, the server is configured for unconstrained delegation. Service ticket request to that server will include the requester's ticket granting ticket stuffed in the service ticket. So user authenticates to a service in an unconstrained server. That user's TGT is stuffed in the service ticket sent to the server, and that's cached uh, at least for a small period of time, if not more, in LSAS on that unconstrained server. So TLDR, if you can get a principal to authenticate to an unconstrained server that you control, you can extract their ticket granting tickets out of memory, whether through um, LSAS manipulation with Mimikatz or through using some of the approved real like LSA APIs. For more information on unconstrained delegation, as always, the link is always adsecurity.org with Sean Metcalf. He talks a bunch more about uh, some of the bunch more of the operational details. Second ingredient, we want to be able to extract those TGTs. So we started building this tool set um, a bit ago to actually support this attack primitive that they came up with. But uh, Rubius is a new C Sharp Kerberos abuse toolkit that's essentially a recoded version of some of Kikio's. Uh, implementation. Kikio is the other project from Benjamin, besides, the other main project besides Mimikatz. It also includes the ability for ticket extraction. So there's a monitor action, which you run it on a host, elevated on a host, on an unconstrained server that you control. It'll monitor for 4624 logon events in the event log. And then it'll extract, extract any new usable ticket granting ticket, Kirby, so like full Kirk cred objects out of memory from LSAS using the approved LSA APIs. So we're not actually opening up a read handle to LSAS. So this isn't like running Mimikatz or Krolsa tickets or Krolsa logon passwords. This is just using Windows APIs in an intended way, because they built the APIs, to extract these ticket blocks. This is the goal. <laughs> so uh, I, th I think I mentioned that there's hundreds and hundreds of RPC servers on machines that I'm pretty sure nobody's looked at before. Uh, this is one of those. So. Uh, Last year, when we were diving into host-based security descriptors, uh, one of the RPC servers identified was printers. Uh, printers are always fun. Uh, so I started diving into uh, what, what goes into the print server RPC uh, calls. So there's 
one interface that you can interact with called the Print System Remote Protocol, MSRP and RPRM. <clears throat> Anybody ever looked at that? No. <laughs> so, uh, at, this protocol has an interesting function in it. So, as I was doing one day, I was reading through the technical specifications on Microsoft's website, Thrilling Reads. Um, and as I was reading through, I came across one of these methods, RPC Remote Find First Printer Change Notification. Obviously looks malicious. Um, essentially, the purpose uh, of it is to, I can say as a user, um, I want, I can say, hey, print server, notify me whenever you have a new print job. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, so let me know whenever there's a new print job for whatever, for whatever reason. What's the implication of this uh, for me as an attacker? Well, how this works underneath is that any domain user can make that request of the print server. Um, and Spooler is enabled on every single machine in modern domains. Um, and so any user can actually request this from any print server uh, in, in a domain. And so what happens is when I make that request, the print server itself, so the spooler service, which is running a system, is actually going to immediately talk back to me just to test connectivity, and it's going to authenticate to whatever machine I tell it to. So I, I can say, uh, for example, I could tell you know the exchange server over there, hey, I want to monitor your print jobs, and when I say that, it's going to connect back to my machine as the exchange server dollar account uh, and try and authenticate to me. So, why is that interesting? Uh, well, this is a won't fix. I told Microsoft it's by design. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea, but my musings did not, they were not listened to. So, um, so again, what does this look like? So, let's say I'm on, I as the attacker, I'm on that top machine over there. I'm going to talk to this server over there and using this print protocol. I'm going to say, please authenticate to other host down there. When I make that request, the server, is then server dollar, that's the server's domain account, is going to authenticate to SMB to other hosts. I get to choose, so I can coerce that machine to use Kerberos or NTLM authentication when that when I make that request. So why is that interesting? Bunch of different abuse scenarios, but we're just going to talk about one, that first one there, talking about unconstrained delegation. So if we compromise an unconstrained delegation server, I can use this to coerce the domain controller to authenticate back to me. When the domain controller authenticates to me, it's going to send its TGT, and I can use that TGT to DC sync because, D uh, yeah. So this is the recipe. I compromise a server that has unconstrained delegation. I start monitoring for TGTs using Rubius. And so it's going to check every five seconds for new people logging onto the machine. And then I'm going to use this printer bug to coerce a domain controller to authenticate to my to the server that I've compromised uh, using spool sample, which is a tool I wrote. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you've got the, the domain controller's ticket, you load that up, DC sync prop. So what does this look like? So here we have Cobalt Strike. We're going to identify unconstrained delegation <coughs> servers using PowerView. So we can see that the SharePoint server has unconstrained delegation enabled. That's fairly typical in some environments. So now we're going to pivot over to that SharePoint server. I don't know how, like maybe we found some more privileged user, an IT admin's cred, whatever. We're going to pivot to that machine. Now we're on an unconstrained delegation server. We're going to start monitoring for new ticket granting tickets using Rubius. So now we're going to be monitoring specifically for the domain controller logging into this machine. And when it logs in, we're going to dump its ticket. So we're going to execute that. It's now monitoring for new logins. We're going to use spool sample to uh, request that ticket. So this is going to coerce the domain controller to authenticate to the SharePoint server that I've compromised. I execute it, we wait a little while for this to happen, and you can see the domain controller authenticated and sent its TGT. Now we can extract the base64 encoded version of that. We're going to write that to a file using some PowerShell, that ticket.kirby. This is on my attacker's host. I'm going to 
write it there, go ahead and execute it. Now we're going to use, now we're going to look it up, load it up. We're going to make a sacrificial logon session so we don't screw anything up. So, yeah, the password doesn't matter here. I'm just doing this so I don't clobber the current logon session. Then I'm going to load up the Kerberos ticket uh, using Beacon. So Kerberos ticket use, path to the ticket I just loaded. Or now that's going to be loaded up. And because I'm a domain controller now, I can use DC Sync to request any user's password. Sure enough. Worked. So that's uh, the point here is there is a bunch of different host based security scripters that can be used, you know, potentially maliciously. Um, or, you know, they're just enabled by default. Any authenticated user can do this. Uh, a lot of people, like, for example, the session enumeration, uh, the, like, so for a long time, SAMR and session enumeration was enabled by default on Windows, which I think is a great thing, or which wasn't a good idea. Uh, Microsoft has since uh, made some changes to restrict that. So, for example, modern versions of Windows, you can't enumerate the local administrators. Um, like we said, though, there's hundreds of RPC servers and many of those have yet to been fully analyzed, and many of them allow any user to connect to them and inter interact with them. Um, and that's exactly what we did with like the print server one there, and there's many others. So, summary. Access is more than, it's more complicated, we'll say, than just the membership and local administrators. <laughs> Host-based security descriptors, whether accidentally misconfigured, uh, configured by defaults incorrectly, or maliciously backdoored, can have far-reaching implications for the security of other systems in the domain, and vice versa. You know, you might have your database compromised because one host has a misconfigured host-based security descriptor. It's an extremely complex system. Defenses should focus on restricting access to all securable objects, host, Active Directory, Exchange, SQL, and everything. This is kind of somewhat uncharted territory, we know. We need, people need to start building the tooling for this, spread awareness, and things like that. It's a very complicated problem, a very complex system, but we think we can start tackling some defensive components for it. So that's pretty much it. Unless we have any questions, we know we started a little bit early. Um, I, don't know if we... yeah, I do want to give a little shout out to Eli Shamir. Uh, I interacted with him previously, and he also subsequently found that print, print or both thing. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to him as well. Any questions?